Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, it is the top of the hour, so we're gonna get started uh, to ensure we have enough time for questions at the end. My name is Jordan Gamart. I'm the program coordinator at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I'm pleased to kick off the early detection and treatment of sepsis webinar today. Before we get started, I'd like to briefly address some housekeeping items. I've muted all of you so that there's no background noise. Um, if you have any questions, we do encourage you to utilize the chat feature uh, with any questions you have during our virtual presentation. Our expert presenters will um, address them at the end. Um, our agenda today will be a five minute overview of our foundation, uh, the groups we work with on a daily basis and our actionable patient safety solutions. Our experts will be presenting for 40 minutes and we'll be finishing today's workshop with a 15 minute uh, question and answer segment. Uh, just to begin, uh, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation's vision is zero preventable patient deaths um, in hospitals by the year 2020. We realize that this is an audacious goal, but we believe that zero is the only acceptable goal to have because one preventable death is one too many. With that said, uh, we strive to foster new efforts and build on existing patient safety programs through the work of our partners and their commitments to zero. Uh, we want to take a fresh approach without reinventing the uh, so who can take action? We work with many groups. Uh, the first group we encourage to take action is um, our hospital and healthcare organizations. So we ask hospitals and healthcare organizations to make formal commitments around an initiative or program they're most proud of. These commitments are publicly posted on our website um, to create a shared learning network among all of our organizations who wanna get involved um, and to improve patient safety. Today we have over uh, 3,500 hospitals across 43 countries who've joined our network. Um, and in February of this last year, we announced through their commitments, uh, they've collectively saved 69,519 lives. Another group we have are our committed partners. Um, these are our key, key associations, societies, and nonprofits. Uh, we ask our committed partners to sign a commitment to action letter, which uh, announces their support of the patient safety movement by taking action. Uh, which is both individualized and sustainable. And um, this includes um, some major organizations that have joined us are uh, Global Sepsis Alliance. Um, the third group we work with are um, healthcare technology companies. So we ask that medical device companies sign our open data pledge. Uh, this is simply an agreement that states they'll share their data openly without interference or charge. To date, uh, we have 84 companies who have signed the open data pledge. A select few of these companies are GE, Philips, Cerner, Draeger, Massimo, Medtronic, Oracle, and IBM, Wat IBM Watson, to name a few. And our last group um, are patient and families. We ask patients who have lived to tell their story or families who may have lost a loved one because of a preventable medical error to share their stories. And these serve as not only an opportunity for for those to learn from, but to work to ensure mistake like the, mistakes like those could never happen again. We have over 50 written stories and several patient story videos, which can be found on our website. Um, and we uh, film these stories each year. Um, oh, and our last group are policymakers. We also function as a 501c4. Um, we do some work on Capitol Hill to increase awareness and promote patient safety legislation. Uh, so these are our apps, um, our actionable patient safety solutions or apps are best practices, or we like to call them recipes, uh, to the leading patient safety challenges our hospitals face today. Our apps are available for free and can be downloaded on our website. Uh, we truly value our subject matter experts like our sepsis experts speaking today um, that help us identify the evidence-based best practices around each of these challenges that we have. Um, and in order to reach our goal of zero by 2017, uh, our next milestone is to save 150,000 lives, both U.S. and internationally. Last year, we had reported um, six, over 69,000 lives saved through the commitments made by, by our partners, and we only hope for this number to grow uh, by 2020. Now on to today's experts. We have uh, Sarah Fallen McManus, uh, who currently serves as an advisory board member for the Sepsis Alliance. Uh, she worked as a critical ner care nurse for more than 20 years and recently retired from GE Healthcare after 20 plus years as their clinical program manager. Sarah is the Patient Safety Movement Foundation Sepsis Ambassador and Regional Network Chair. We have Dr. Ryan Arnold, uh, who's a practicing physician special who specializes in emergency medicine and is the research director for the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Christiana Care Health System in Delaware. Uh, 
He also serves as senior clinical investigator at the Value Institute within Christiana Care. Uh, Dr. And then lastly, we have Dr. Chris Fee. Um, he's an associate professor of clinical emergency medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, he's mentored medical students and residents in quality improvement initiatives and research and served as UCSF's emergency medicine residency program director. Um, he's also the chair of our sepsis work group. So let's get started with our first speaker, Sarah McManus, um, who's going to lead us through the next slide, the video. I would like to share this brief video of Dr. Marty Dobek and her son, Zachary. In 2014, she found herself on the patient side of things when her healthy 11-year-old son developed severe sepsis due to an aggressive infection in his femur. It was a regular Wednesday. We met Zach at the game. And after the game, he started to cry. And the first thing he said was, my knee hurts, I have a headache, and I'm dizzy. <coughs> Over the course of the next four days, he became more and more ill. And on Saturday evening, we took him to the emergency room. They immediately started IV antibiotics. And finally, by that evening, we were told that he needed to be put into a medically induced coma to be put on a respirator. And at that point, the diagnosis of sepsis was confirmed. He stayed that way for 12 days and had multiple complications. I kept thinking, am I going to be a mom who loses a child? It can happen to your parent. It can happen to your spouse. It can happen to you. So you need to know what it is and what to look for. And to learn more about the symptoms, go to sepsis.org. Thankfully, Zachary survived. He spent almost a month in the hospital and six surgeries on his right leg. After leaving the hospital, he spent eight additional weeks in a pediatric rehabilitation facility, gaining strength and mobility. Today, Zach is essentially a normal 14-year-old. He has a few complications, including nerve damage, which causes a mild limp, but he does enjoy running and playing in the park with his friends. So what is sepsis? It is the body's toxic response to an infection. It kills about 258,000 people every year in the U.S. That's more people than die from breast cancer, prostate cancer, and AIDS combined. In the hospital setting, sepsis is the leading cause of death and contributes to one in every two to three deaths. Of these deaths, the majority of patients presented to the hospital with sepsis. When you have an infection, which can be bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic, your immune system works hard to fight it. Sometimes it can fight the infection on its own, and other times it needs help with drugs like antibiotics, antifungals, or antiviral medications. For reasons not understood, Sometimes, instead of fighting the infection, your body starts to attack itself. The response to the infection is sepsis. The body develops a systemic inflammatory response, which causes diffuse endothelial disruption and micro microcirculatory defects. This results in global tissue hypoxia and organ dysfunction. When multiple organ dysfunction and refractory hypotension occurs, this is septic shock. People may refer to sepsis as blood poisoning, but that term isn't accurate anymore. Sepsis is not an infection and it's not contagious. It's your body's reaction to an infection. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon to hear that a patient died of complications of pneumonia or complications from an infection. When in reality, the person died from sepsis. It is also not rare. In fact, about 1.6 million people in the U.S. develop sepsis every year. Sepsis does not discriminate, and anyone of any age can get sepsis. There are those at a higher risk, including people with chronic medical conditions such as diabetes, lung disease, cancer, kidney disease. Also, people with weakened immune systems, which 
can be caught taking medic medications like steroids or chemotherapy are also at more risk. The very young are also at higher risk because they don't have a fully developed immune system yet. On the other end of the spectrum, the very old are also at a higher risk. And if you've had sepsis before, you may be at a higher risk to develop it again. And the myth really is, it's not gonna to happen to my family. So some of the complications after, after a person does have sepsis, one of the greatest unknowns is the number of sepsis survivors. Unfortunately, the treatment needed to save people from dying from sepsis can cause long-term consequences, such as post-sepsis syndrome, PTSD, organs not working properly, and even amputations. Post-sepsis syndrome is a condition that affects up to 50% of sepsis survivors. They are left with physical and or psychological long-term effects, such as insomnia, difficulty getting to sleep and staying asleep, nightmares, hallucinations, panic attacks, disabling muscle and joint pains, extreme fatigue, poor concentration, and decreased mental or cognitive functioning, loss of self-esteem and self-belief, and just a change in the life that they used to have to the life that they do have. One of the survivors that I met was in grad school and had a young child at the time when she developed sepsis. She was treated in a timely manner in the emergency department and was admitted to the medical floor when her blood pressure responded, so she avoided the ICU stay. She recovered and went home, but the post-sepsis syndrome symptoms were debilitating. She had difficulty with memory and couldn't concentrate. She also had severe fatigue and joint pains. She was forced to drop out of school and struggled to get through her basic daily routine. Similarly, there are many survivors who are diagnosed with PTSD following the treatment. In severe cases, amputations are required after surviving sepsis. The medications given to keep the blood flow going to the major organs can cause tissue death in the extremities. Often this happens in the fingers and toes first. Many live with disabilities for the rest of their lives and feel they are alone and that no one understands how they're feeling and what they've gone through. Some of the, moving on to the challenges, uh, some of the challenges uh, are, are just the fact that the symptoms are so subtle. Many times, hospitals um, have patients present with uh, such vague, vague symptoms. And this may delay arrival to the emergency department, detection at triage, or recognition during the hospital admission process. Frequently, symptoms of sepsis mimic less severe conditions. It's not uncommon that you hear somebody that ends up with sepsis maybe was fast-tracked um, because they basically felt like it was something minor. The symptoms can include shivering, fever, feeling cold, extreme pain, general discomfort, pale, discolored skin. There may be a rash that won't go away when you press on it, being sleepy, difficult to arouse or confuse feeling like the person might die, and shortness of breath. And these can be quite vague. Some of these, you think maybe you have the flu. It's when somebody has the combination of these symptoms along with an infection that that sepsis should be a concern and ask, have you considered sepsis? With sepsis, often a patient's condition escalates quite rapidly. In most cases, no one hospital department owns sepsis, which can contribute uh, to the delays. Some communities also have limited sepsis identification and management resources in their hospital facilities. 
Now you'll see here the plot on the left shows an increased proportion of patients with severe sepsis as they progress to septic shock, antibiotics are delayed. And on the right, the odds of dying among patients with septic shock are increased as antibiotics are delayed. It's found that mortality increases about 8% every hour without antibiotic administration. So what can you do? You can first find out at your own hospital, you know, where do you start? You can ask what your hospital sepsis mortality is today. What is your, your hospital blood cultures, antibiotics, fluids, vasopressors, and repeat lactate? Also, does your hospital utilize an integrated electronic medical record for sepsis identification, surveillance, or in, in with the clinical workflow? The incidence of sepsis is startling, but up to half of sepsis deaths could be prevented by timely recognition and treatment, and many complications could be avoided. The actionable patient safety solutions, or apps, early detection and treatment of sepsis, is a key tool that all hospitals can use to improve patient outcomes globally. The components of the apps are listed with the executive summary checklist, performance gap, leadership commitment, practice and technology plans, patient and family engagement, along with the metrics. And you'll see here where you can download it um, to get your own copy. And this is currently being updated and we should have a version uh, to replace it by the end of the year. Now, Dr. Arnold will mention some of the controversies that exist today. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and I think one of the challenges that uh, many that are on the front line of detecting and treating sepsis is realizing that there are discrepancies between even internal agreements among the treatment uh, nurses and physicians on when the patient actually has criteria and has sepsis. Um, many of you know the initial de definitions included SERS criteria and inflammatory response and how those relate to the, to the current criteria. And with many of the then once identify what is the even treatment recommendations to go forward, um, as many are aware of the recent trials that have addressed early goal directed therapy and, and dictated that perhaps a, there was not a benefit there. However, the challenge and I think the interpretation of those trials is important to understand that this is all in the context of a much more aggressive and attentive uh, clinical team. So the next slide and, and to address this, I want to show that we we, you know, we have a ways to, to utilize this where we are now focusing our uh, detection and messaging towards different bodies within the hospital system. So messages that are targeting our providers on the front line may be different than those to our administrators as well as different to our families and the patients themselves. And this is important though to have targeted information to each one of these groups as it gets you different you know, uh, results. The, the importance of moving towards providers understanding this is a more common agreement upon the, it, its currents and as well the disease severity. Whereas when hospital administrators are aware of it, you'll understand the sepsis burden within your system and better able to address how much resources can go towards this. When patients and families are aware, now they're better able to detect and sometimes even make clinical teams aware of a patient's deterioration in things more subtle such as mental status and perhaps respiratory effort, things that families are oftentimes more attuned to than even our clinical teams. Um, and as we move on, you'll see that the, the, the concept of, of, inc of incorporating this to these groups will help your team understand and, and provide better resources. As you step back from all the discrepancies and disagreements and definition, one of the concepts we've put together here is, is the, the idea of looking at sepsis on a spectrum and understanding that anyone with an infection at any time Please enter your access code at risk of developing sepsis. And once your infection that a patient has, whether it's viral or bacterial, translates and transfers into organ dysfunction, now you'll have, you've met the criteria even at early subtle times for sepsis as, a, as an entity. So you'll 
whatever you your system is used, uh, you'll you'll notice that you can advance the slide. We'll, I'll show you that there's you have different aspects of organ dis systems dysfunction, and when those happen, you now have incorporated different criteria with which your system identifies this patient has crossed that line. And that could be an altered mental status, that could be lab values of new oxygen requirements, new respiratory distress. As a family, this idea of moving from the infection to sepsis is better made aware when, when everyone agrees and understands what those thresholds are. But the challenges for us on the front line is you have to have, you might have different uh, agreement on who has it. So in the next slide, you'll see just some comparisons of when you might target a system, for example, compliance with the new CMS guidelines and what those uh, identify, but you'll notice that that will omit by definition a certain criteria, certain group of people. And moving on, you'll see that maybe perhaps you're going with the new sepsis three definition and, and using that as your definition. However, again, understanding you will be omitting a certain group of people. There are also systems in place such as um, this, that, that utilize Cerner and they have their own sepsis alerting tool, again, which is useful and helpful, but can be omitting. And I think the message here is to understand that as a system, you have to be aware of who you are targeting and what happens when you omit that group. So that's just where if you are com targeting complete compliance with CMS, you might be omitting a very important population that you still want your system to be aware of, even if CMS was not as interested, quote unquote, in that group. So now moving on to what we've done in our system, I'll give you guys an example on the provider side. To improve this, we've designed a sepsis alert process. And this is driven, as you'll see here, by criteria that the clinical team uh, once identified will initiate. And what this does is we focus in on the alert process on the next slide. You'll see that we have a threshold to identify that when any clinician orders an antibiotic or antiviral, you now have assessments that are guided for any degree of organ dysfunction. Once this occurs, then you've met the criteria in our system for a sepsis alert. And what this does is on the next slide, you'll see the, the, the response that this generates is a bedside huddle. And this huddle is similar to the huddles you guys may have experienced in your systems for a trauma, a, acute, a heart attack, or a stroke in which we, we dictate bedside discussions for various aspects important to sepsis care. Is there adequate IV access? What fluids are we going to be giving? Is there adequate antibiotics in, in, in place? And what other diagnostic tests are necessary? This huddle can be quick and, and uh, reproduced uh, with a very minimal effort as opposed to some of the other efforts we know that can take some time. The nice thing about this is it also alerts and labels the patient and makes everyone aware on the team from the nurse to the docs and the residents as well as to uh, the family and the patient themselves of the they are being labeled with sepsis and that actually helps in many ways that are sometimes even hard to quantify in just the overall system-wide awareness for this for this event we also have an assist you'll on the next slide you'll see if you can advance to an, a code status within our system and that dictates a higher level of severity in this scenario you'll see the patients who have been provided initial care who persist to show abnormalities that are that are high severity high risk of mortality such as low blood pressures and high lactates after fluids will dictate a, a repeat of that bedside huddle and a code will be, will be um, established that brings now our ICU team involved. A more direct and um, comprehensive assessment for the next level of interventions that we need to be given. Um, this process, again, is one that, that uh, is a much smaller select group of patients, but that repeat bedside huddle is now further identifying to the team and the patient that the severity is much higher and dictates that clinical care that we think is so important. Um, on the next slide, you'll be seeing that we'll, we'll be work, moving towards now um, a developing, and this is something that can be happening both on paper as or higher fidelity within your EHR, but we are working on systems where we are pushing information to our clinicians uh, next slide, please, I'm sorry, that, that, that we're developing where you are informing your docs that the patient meets criteria. Uh, one more slide, I apologize there, one more. There we go. That you'll see here that now in, in the context of giving patients antibiotics, you are letting them know that your patient has these, these uh, presence of organ dysfunction and that, you know, uh, kind of pushing to them the idea that, did you know your patient meets sepsis criteria? Can we label them for you? 
and, and allow you to move forward. Now this push mechanism is takes some cooperation and collaboration with IT and design folks, but you'll find that it, it drives compliance with a lot of these measures because you are now requiring a, a, a clinician to now put on, on their order set, yes, I've, I'm treating sepsis and, and, and here's a criteria I've met, allowing them to be you know, much more compliant. And this is, we found a, a driven a lot of, of, uh, of you know, improvement in our, in our capture of these patients. Um, and then at the end, you'll see the next slide that you can then go on to actually dictating what you want them to do with this information, give fluids, order blood cultures, et cetera. Um, and then to, fi to, to finalize here, I just want to show you quick, two quick examples that we've done that have been integral in our cultural in, uh, improvement here, which is uh, feedback. So on the next slide, you'll see that part of our immediate feedback we've done is, is starting to incorporate reports to our clinician clinical team. Um, these reports show, um, you can go to the next slide, yeah, the, the, this is a good example on this immediate feedback where you can be given on the day of your treatment examples to how your patient met criteria and what things were performed or maybe were indicated to be performed and were not. Uh, this will include our, you know, a collective message to both our nurse, our docs, and our residents if involved that allows the team to understand that they are, uh, you know, kind of where, what was expected of them and where they maybe could have improved next time. We find that case-based reviews are integral for this kind of uh, adoption. And on the next um, slide, you'll see that one of the exciting new products we've started is a forecasting model where we're trying to improve the awareness and capture the, the, the team kind of dynamic of understanding how sick these patients can be. And we're doing this in the way of a forecasting model. Um, the, the objectives on the next slide I'll show, you know, will, will elicit that, that this quality improvement effort is targeting an improvement in the um, in the system-wide awareness, but also doing that through gamification where we actually have the teams predict outcomes and then give them feedback as to those patients' outcomes down the line. Now, what's interesting about sepsis outcomes is they are generally delayed by several days to weeks, uh, as you'll find with your sepsis patients when you track them. And you'll notice that on the next you know, page that we've had, the, the, the resources we needed for this have been an, an extensive group of helping either uh, sepsis nurses or our volunteer research team but you'll see that um, on the next slide an example of what the what we asked them to forecast specifically targeting like what their patients how long they'll be there and the outcomes of those patients to include will they go to an icu and and, and have a higher risk of mortality and then what the report that we generate on the next slide you'll see gives a very concrete feedback to the to the clinicians as to what they predicted and what was observed and what is interesting, what we found is that on the bottom, you'll see that we have this reporting of the average scores of our nurses and docs, and, and that they all kind of really enjoy comparing how they're doing to each other and to themselves. But it's also they really appreciate we found the feedback of knowing what, their, what happened to their patient as those outcomes can be delayed by five to 15 days at times. So um, this has been a very integral piece for our success and something that we feel is very helpful in, um, in driving this change. Um, so I'll be handing off now to Dr. Fee, who can go and, and describe some of the efforts that they've had on their successful with a higher fidelity tool at UCSF. Thanks, <clears throat> excuse me. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, I thought it would it'd be beneficial, perhaps, to some uh, in the audience who have not yet instituted a um, sepsis screen through use of an EMR at their facility, who may be interested in doing so and learning a little bit from both our failures as well as our successes and ongoing um, uh, tweaks to the system to continuously improve it. And I'm going to start back about 15 years ago when I first uh, started as a clinician at UCSF. And shortly after arriving here, it was clear to me and to others that we needed to uh, develop a bit of a more robust uh, interaction between us and our critical care uh, colleagues in, in terms of implementing and improving the management of patients with sepsis that came through our emergency department. And I think it's important to know that in our facility, and this is not unique to UCSF, it's, it's certainly um, true of a number of facilities, but about 70 to 80% of all patients in this medical center who present, or, or who, I should say, who are ultimately uh, diagnosed with severe sepsis or septic shock first present in the emergency department. So if we're really talking about uh, these critical interventions that, that uh, have a significant impact on mortality, uh, 
and if they're time-based, i.e. That, that the quicker you can intervene, the, the better your outcome will be, then you really need to include your emergency department uh, personnel uh, in these discussions and in these uh, guideline uh, development uh, strategies. So I, I was fortunate to walk into a good situation here where th that was recognized and had great colleagues uh, within the uh, critical care world here. I will say it failed. Uh, so we, we implemented a, a process whereby if a patient was um, identified in the emergency department as having septic shock, I think we all patted ourselves on the back thinking that we did a good job of initiating fluids and, and giving you know, antibiotics after getting cultures and uh, initiating pressors and, and ventilation strategies if needed. Well, those are the easy patients to identify. Those are the sickest of the sick, and they, they, they are, are fairly easy to identify. It's, it's the, the people who are kind of teetering on the edge sometimes or, or uh, have somewhat more subtle um, presentations that can be tricky. And those are the ones I think you actually, uh, to be honest with you, have a, a better chance of rescuing, if you will, uh, to begin with. But it's wholly dependent upon identifying them early on. And I say that 15 years ago when we had this joint program between us and ICU that it, it, it somewhat failed and that it was uh, difficult to, uh, in our system anyway, to, uh, to really delineate who was responsible for what, at what point should, should the patient be transferred to the, to the ICU, who was going to place the central line if it was necessary, et cetera. It, it, it kind of swirled around that transition of care issue that we all know is a, is a dangerous point for patients. Um, so we kind of... Uh, teetered along with that for a little while. And then several years after that, uh, there was increased scrutiny uh, in the institution from our own within, uh, as well as um, from some external uh, bodies. We were participating in a demonstration project uh, that had financial re repercussions, but it was really about improving the care for patients. Uh, and, and that spurred on uh, a new uh, degree of vigor within the institution to really demonstrate that we could do something here and make a difference. Uh, and the really important thing here, I think, that I, I can't emphasize enough is that the, the, uh, the institution at the highest levels, our C-suite, our, our CMO, our CEO, our chief technology officer, et cetera, all back this uh, 100%. That means that they were supporting us with resources uh, and not just lip service. So there were financial um, resources as well as personnel uh, that were dedicated to this project. And I, I don't think we could have been successful without that. Um, we, uh, the, the institution inst uh, implemented uh, a big gathering of medicine, in, uh, emergency medicine, critical care, et cetera, and brought in an outside consultant. And that, the, that last slide at the very bottom said, a small test of change. I'll never forget sitting in this room and they, they said, you know, what are you going to do in the next several weeks as a small test of change to try to screen patients in your emergency department for sepsis? And they were tossing around ideas like, um, you know, on a paper-based screen, can you check for SERS criteria at triage on 5% of your patients? Um, have your triage nurses do that. And here's where I think another lesson learned uh, can't be emphasized enough. And that is that you need to know your individual unit. And I don't mean hospital or medical center. I mean down to the individual unit. So for, for me, it was the emergency department. You need to know the culture of that unit. And I could tell this group that this small test of change, i.e. implementing a 5% uh, patient volume screen on paper, was not going to work. It was uh, ad hoc. It was a change in workflow to introduce a new form. Uh, people were going to forget it, or they would fill it out, and it would go you know, sit on a desk somewhere. What we decided to do, and you can go to the next slide, uh, was to take advantage of a homegrown, um, very rudimentary uh, ED electronic surveillance system. So our chairman at the time created a, like I said, a very rudimentary electronic medical record, which was really just a, a FileMaker Pro based database, which if those of you know, uh, those of you who know FileMaker Pro might recognize some of the format here. This is just a database that included, uh, you know, sort of typical stuff up at triage, uh, chief complaint, triage vitals, et cetera. But what we recognized was that the system itself, we, we, we could take advantage of the fact that a computer is, is likely going to be smarter than us, or at least more facile and, and not distractible the way we are. Um, and we had the, the computer set up such that if you met two or more uh, service criteria at, tri uh, yeah, at triage, which means all the vital sign based things, so heart rate, temperature, and respiratory rate, that it would flag uh, the triage nurse and say, hey, this patient meets SERS criteria. Do you think the patient might have an infection? If so, please notify the faculty. Uh, and that's what 
our first step was. Um, you can go on to the next slide. And, and this is what it looked like. It was nothing fancy. It was very kind of basic. It says your patient has two or more SERS criteria uh, and a suspected infection, if that were true. And it kind of gives some guidelines on, or guidance on what should be done. You know, draw labs that are appropriate, potentially uh, blood cultures, and consider uh, um, end organ dysfunction, looking for the other uh, uh, lab parameters and or um, uh, exam findings that might uh, confirm that, and then you know consider giving fluids, et cetera. This was the the version that popped up when the physician opened the note. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. The problem with this system was that it was very rudimentary, and it only included our triage vital signs. So subsequent vital signs that that uh, took place or were recorded after the patient was moved into the room would not be captured by the system. We, it wasn't smart enough to do that. It was also um, the alert would pop up at triage only and when the physician first opened the note. But again, as lab uh, value data came in, like the white blood cell count or uh, creatinine or liver function uh, that could potentially indicate uh, subsequent end organ dysfunction that wasn't recognized up front, there was no way to, to um, set up the alert within that system to, to alert our providers uh, that, the, that that was the case. So it identified people early if they presented with the signs at triage, but we know that people don't come in with a sign on their forehead that says, I have sepsis. They may have normal vital signs or, or not meet the criteria uh, at hour one, but they may meet it at hour two, three, or four, and those patients had the potential to slip through the cracks. Um, and it only, as I mentioned, it only uh, appeared once, that alert. So subsequent providers, if there was a sign out or, again, if the, critical, uh, the clinical status had changed, we wouldn't be aware of it. Uh, so move on to the next slide, please. Now, we knew that when we were developing the system, it was going to be uh, on a trial basis because approximately three months after we initiated that uh, uh, screening process, which, again, as opposed to doing a 5% screen at triage on paper, we went to the next day uh, changing the, uh, the uh, electronic medical record and screened 100% of patients uh, and have been ever since. But three months after that, we went to a, a fully integrated EMR. And the fully integrated EMR had some power that our uh, rudimentary version did not. And that the, the main one is that it had the ability to screen not only the triage vital signs, but all the subsequent vital signs that were inputted into the system. So uh, serial uh, heart rates, blood pressures, temperatures, respiratory rates, et cetera. And, and to uh, take it one step further, could also screen the labs as they were coming in. And so we had now had a system that we could build again with the support of our medical center uh, and IT folks that would excuse me have a, a continuous surveillance in the background and so anytime a nurse physician or pharmacist in the ED entered the chart of one of our patients if at any point during that stay in the ED the person met a criteria for two or more SERS criteria this alert would come up and again it would tell you what the uh, what the concerns were that your patient met SERS criteria. If you felt that they had an infection, it would uh, suggest uh, further lab values that you might want to uh, draw, as well as the interventions that you should uh, put in place. This was purely if they had SERS criteria. And you can uh, move on to the next slide, which shows uh, what uh, the alert looks like, a slightly more obnoxious color, uh, going from the, you know, the low level of alert and the yellow color to the uh, more significant, your patient's really sick alert color, uh, which says now not only do you meet SERS criteria, but your patient has end organ dysfunction. So now you're talking about uh, low blood pressure or uh, you know, creatinine abnormalities and elevated lactate, et cetera. And again, this would pop up not only for our residents, but also faculty, nurses, and pharmacists, and, uh, and the, atten you know, the attending, as I mentioned. So if somebody else saw it and they weren't the attending, they were instructed to go ahead and uh, alert the attending right away. This was This was not something that could be sitting and waiting to be addressed. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. As you might have d picked up on, the problem with this system was that it really de depended upon somebody going into that patient's chart. Now, we're fortunate in the emergency department to be going into patient's charts uh, fairly commonly as we're checking on uh, incoming lab values and checking on uh, or, or adding a new note to update status, et cetera. But the problem is if the clinical status changed, you know, vital signs, which again could be subtle, uh, suddenly met criteria, or if a white blood cell count, uh, count came back, but nobody looked at it and nobody got into the um, into the chart, 
they could, a patient theoretically could meet criteria, but nobody knew it because they weren't looking into the chart. And so to address that issue, we created a column in our, in our uh, sort of our virtual track board of where patients are, which you can see to the far right there, if it had that yellow star in it, that indicated that person met SERS criteria. If they uh, had the severe alert, i.e. they had end organ dysfunction, that star would turn orange. And if they were in, uh, if the provider indicated that that person truly had uh, severe sepsis or septic shock uh, by clicking, yes, this person has an infection, it would turn red. And that would allow everybody in the department to know exactly the status of that patient. If the provider felt that the SERS criteria or end, end organ dysfunction was not due to an infection, so i.e. not severe sepsis or septic shock, they would click on it and interact with that alert. And rather than having the star on the trackboard disappear, it would stay gray, indicating to everybody in the department that, yes, we know this person has a vital sign and lab abnormalities. We don't think it's due to an infection, but this person's still sick. And so it should be on our radar screen. We didn't want it to drop off entirely. So moving on to the next slide. You can see what uh, has happened since we've implemented our, our uh, electronic surveillance. The, the blue line there, trend line, is our compliance with the, the sepsis uh, bundle of care. And you can see how it has dramatically increased. And it, it was in uh, late 2011 where we implemented our screen, uh, or I guess early 2012, uh, where we implemented the, the, the more robust electronic screen. You can see sort of the jump in our compliance level there. And then our subsequent or, or cor correlated uh, decrease in mortality in our patients. And this is, these, these data represent all of the patients at UCSF. And I think it's really important to note that we in the emergency department were the first unit to go live with uh, our screen. We have subsequently uh, adapted our screening model to all of the units in the entire hospital. So the various wards, the ICU, et cetera. And just as I mentioned earlier, how critically important it was to adapt to our, lo our, uh, our local culture as to what we knew uh, our nurses would, would and wouldn't uh, do or uh, like to do or, or how they would respond and fit into their workflow. Uh, and, as well as our fish, uh, physicians and pharmacists. When we implemented and adapted the screening system into the other units in the hospital over time, uh, it was critically important that we adapted the, the screening tools. For example, we have a, a large liver transplant service here. And if we were using uh, things like um, uh, total bilirubin, for example, to use as a screen for end organ dysfunction, they were gonna get a tremendous number of false alarms or false positives. So we adapted some of the, the metrics or the screens that were being used to the individual units to try to optimize uh, the sensitivity and specificity and to reduce uh, uh, false positive alerts. The interesting thing, and I'll, I'll end on this uh, anecdote, is that when we adapted uh, these uh, screening tools to our, our different units in, in the hospital, we oftentimes would run the the system in the background, but not have it live to the providers, meaning that we could see when people were meeting the various criteria and run reports and see how often that would happen and get down to the individual patient level and see exactly when the alert would turn positive. At the same time, we could cross-reference that patient and look in the records to see when a rapid response team was notified uh, about a patient's deterioration and compare the time from when our alert would have picked it up to when uh, clinically it was addressed and it was a dramatic difference. We saw um, times of anywhere from a few hours up to 12 or even more hours earlier uh, when our alert went off compared to when um, the, the rapid response team was uh, notified. When the uh, alerts went live on the other units, we saw a similar increase in compliance and a, a similar kind of uh, stepwise decrease in our mortality from a, a, a medical center-wide uh, standpoint. So we think that there's uh, a correlation there. It's hard to prove that it was the one and only thing, because it wasn't. We had a lot of education uh, efforts uh, and review, uh, like Ryan was talking about. Uh, I think it's critically important, particularly early on, when you are adapting and, and implementing a system like this, that you provide feedback to your uh, frontline providers so that they understand why the alert went off um, and, and understand how to interact with it. Uh, next slide, please, and then I'll, I'm almost done. So the lessons learned, as I mentioned, institutional support, <clears throat> excuse me, for us was critical. Having uh, the resources, IT and personnel time uh, to uh, address what we wanted to do was, was uh, uh, absolutely critical. We wouldn't have been able to have the successes we had without it. Uh, 
the initial education case review that, that uh, Ryan had mentioned, the timely feedback is really critical early on. If you don't have that piece, people think you're implementing a system just to annoy them. You know, what are these alerts? Why do they keep going off? Why did my patient have this trigger? And if you can give them the immediate feedback, pull the vital sign data and the lab data and say, here's why it went off, and you get that aha moment, uh, it raises the, the level of um, uh, attentiveness uh, among your entire staff. For us, a paper-based screening tool on the wards, as I mentioned, wasn't uh, particularly helpful, but when we adapted the EMR surveillance system across the board so that it was taken out of the hands of providers who are busy and distracted, uh, these little subtle changes in, in clinical status could be more readily uh, um, identified and sooner. And then again, of course, the importance of adapting to your local uh, culture. What works in our system may not work for you. What works in our ED doesn't work necessarily on the floors. And then uh, the next slide, please. And this is just to, to, to summarize what we've discussed. So sepsis is common, obviously very costly, extremely high mortality with significant sequelae for those survivors and their family members and those who love them. Uh, early identification and intervention saves lives. We know this from a number of studies. It's really critical that local champions, uh, in, not only at the institution, but at each uh, department that touches these patients, uh, continue to cheerlead and to, to educate and to provide feedback to the providers. Otherwise, your program will be des uh, destined to, to uh, fail. And again, one size does not fit all. You need to adapt it to your local uh, culture and, and what resources you have available in your setting. I, I realize what we have done won't necessarily work at every hospital. And with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Ryan. Thanks, Chris. Um, and just wanted to highlight some of the uh, partnerships and, and an exciting one with Sepsis Alliance for those that are unaware of this group. Um, this is a nonprofit patient advocacy group that really helps with identification and, and awareness for, for um, patients and families about not only uh, signs to, be, to detect and to be aware of sepsis when it's occurring, but also um, resources that help them understand uh, that, that the, the community is much larger, I think, than people are aware previously, as well as uh, some of the sequelae in, this, in the recovery period that Sarah went through today. Um, on the next slide, you'll see some of the resources that Sepsis Alliance has um, and why this is such a, a useful tool. And I'll tell you that I've personally incorporated this in some of my patient interactions uh, with these very um, um, handouts that are, that are geared towards patient audiences with uh, infographs that can be helpful within your department for providers, but also the information guides and how sepsis relates specifically to different syndromes and, and, and conditions, such high, high risk situations such as patients with cancer, immune, immune um, kind of suppressed states such as HIV, uh, and other common scenarios such as COPD patients uh, and, and many others you know, that you can see there. On the next slide, you'll see some of the um, you know, the references and, and the opportunities within this, including the video that Sarah played today is one of many that are very helpful for kind of setting the stage for the importance of this um, and, and the importance of how this has spoken to, uh, you know, our patients and families to understand what they have. You'll see in the next slide that there are some examples of some of these infographics and what they look like. And they very are, are very simple and really help for, helpful to, the, the patient and the family understand why this label is being applied to them and how this, how this um, is useful. What's interesting is that some of the feedback I've had is when, when a family member, you know, in taking care of a, uh, of, of, um, of a patient who has a pneumonia and they get told that now actually the patient has sepsis, even though it's the exact same scenario that the patient was aware of, now that that label's been applied to them, they are much more attuned as a po and aware of just being monitoring of the, how that patient does and asking harder questions, which I think is very useful in a clinical setting because of that label now being applied to them. And I think it's been uh, a useful tool that, that, that kind of puts them at ease. And if you think of it in, a, in the context of, of you know, a cancer patient going through cancer and knowing the path forward for chemotherapy, sometimes these are tools that help them understand that it can be a long road of both about you know recovery uh, and, and and next steps for in the next in, in surviving. So, some of these tools. The next slide, you'll see just a few of the examples here that that are very useful that I, that that really speak to specific instances instances about why these labels might get applied. For example, a patient with with appendicitis and and they might meet criteria for sepsis, and sometimes that is that is a a surprise to many of these patients. And so, it's very helpful for them to see this. And I, and I and I found a very um, you know, positive interaction with my 
patients and their families with this. Um, and next slide, I think there's a, an upcoming, um, oh, there's also, this is a, one of the exciting, I'm sorry, one more slide back, I apologize. Um, this just showing you that the, the, the focus on the life after sepsis, this has been in a, a collaboration of Sepsis Alliance with the CDC, and really un, you know, emphasizing uh, an aspect that doesn't often get talked about within the clinical setting because we are so focused on the immediacy and the response of the current condition, but really setting the stage and the expectations for the patients of the recovery period for sepsis and how long this can take and what can be involved there. I think we're starting to understand better now but it's something that has been overlooked. And I think the assumption has been that once you're discharged previously, you're back to a, a normal state. And that's uh, far from true, uh, we're seeing now. Um, and, and just to, for, the, for all the audience to, to, to run the next slide, you'll see an upcoming important webinar that is being discussed looking at um, antibiotic stewardship uh, as a big advocacy from the CDC and how, that, how, you, how do you align that with your sepsis efforts? Because if, remember the message of stewardship is, is the appropriate use of antibiotics with the timely de-escalation and not initiation in cases where they're not necessary, but how do you march that in, in combination with your sepsis efforts to be, you know, uh, very broad, broad, broadly appro applied to the patients when you identify them early. So it's a very useful and helpful tool, and I think it's something that is worth it to head, to head, head on as, in your institution because you'll have the efforts should be aligned and aware of each other's work because you don't want to um, have one, you know, counteracting the, the efforts of the other side. So. Um, I think that's it for today's slides, and we'll now open up for questions and any uh, specifics. Here's the website for Sepsis Alliance for those looking for those free um, uh, port patient advocacy uh, items you can print out and give to them, and, and, and are, are great, great tools as well to get access there. So, uh, welcome any questions now. And um, Thanks, Dr. Arnold. Uh, just as a reminder, please type your questions through the public chat interface. Um, I know if you have, if you join by by phone, that'll be difficult for you, but um, I'm trying to avoid um, putting everyone, uh, I don't want to have any background noise if I unmute to everybody on the line. So if you could uh, utilize that feature, that would be great. Uh, we do have one question. Um, how much, I think this is to Dr. Fee, how much of the, de the decrease in mortality at UCSF is due to an increased denominator, increased identification of people with less severe sepsis? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Miguel. I think that's a, a, a really important and astute question. We, we, we certainly asked ourselves the same thing. And when we looked at the, uh, the overall morbidity uh, within our medical center, we did stratify and look at uh, various ways of trying to risk adjust. And with all the models that we did, mostly through our quality improvement uh, team, but also looking at the data that we report out um, to the um, oh, why am I blanking it to the UHC the University Health um, was it a health uh, consortium uh, it looks like it's not a dilutional factor that I, I suspect that there is some degree of that it's it's hard to tease out in the end but it looks like even among the sickest of the uh, the sick cohort the, the septic shock patients that our mortality did decline so I think it's a little bit of a mixed picture that there's probably a dilutional effect with identifying uh, some patients who may not have been in the high mortality group. Uh, we have certainly made an impact on both. And I think um, the other thing I'll just add to that is I, I don't care if it's a little dilutional because obviously we want to pick up on those people who aren't quite as sick and prevent them from getting to that point. So uh, I think the, the question is a good one and it's a little hard to, to answer with any specific metrics, but in, in every way we've looked at it, it looks like uh, the, the, the trend line is real. Great, thank you. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and unmute all of the callers that have called in. Um, so if you don't have any questions for the chat, we will give you the opportunity to ask your questions now. But if you don't have anything to say, please mute yourself so that we don't hear any background noise. I guess please mute yourself if you don't have any questions so that we can uh, hear anyone who does have questions. We do have one question uh, from the chat. At what point does a septic hemorrhage rash appear in some patients with sepsis? Uh, 
Um, so I, I can address it to start. Maybe Chris, you can add as we go on as well. I think that what's interesting about those the rashes you'll see with the um, what was described as petechia or purpura, the, the the hemorrhagic rashes that, that that when you push them, they don't blanch, they don't go away. Is that they can be anywhere in the course, and they can you sometimes see them at the end of a of a critically ill patient, but. Uh, the, the awareness of them early on when patients maybe don't have other manifestations or clear cut signs of it, when you see that rash, um, I think that's the biggest utility when the push the awareness of those rashes are there. So while it can be variable in many patients and, and never occur in some patients, the, it's, it's the, the importance is, is understanding that if you see that in an, in an early case of infection, you know, a, a, a medical evaluation, be, a very, very quick evaluation would be very important because that could be a very early sign of, of a highly severe, uh, highly deadly, uh, you know, Ill, illness stage at that point. Great, thank you. Yeah, I, I would just echo what, uh, what Ryan said there that uh, unfortunately the majority of patients won't develop that rash. So it's one of those things where it's lack, uh, lack of a presence doesn't, shouldn't reassure you, but if you see it, it should be quite concerning.